Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. And then he stood up to the, by the door and he looked at us. He goes, American, black man, white man, you die. <laughs> it's like he was Wait trying. for it. He's going to tell you what he did next. I was like, I've had, I had enough of this shit, dude. Hold my bag. So the door opened up. I knew exactly about how much time I had before the door closed. And I went, I went and I followed him. I tapped him on the He looked back and I socked him. <laughs> I try, not not so hard, but enough to kind of drop him. Got back on the train and left. And I'm like, hey, baby, we're going back to America. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you you got back here and your family embraced you. Yeah. Mom yeah. said, come in, yeah. stay with us. Yeah. And uh, yeah. family looks out for family. And you and you and I'm going bouncing all over the place. But yeah. you talked about your roots from Trinidad. Right. How family looks out for family. You would never disrespect a teacher. You would never. Right. And your family came forward and said, hey, we got a, not only a job for you, but a career as a high paying. I did. <laughs> I, I was a welder's assistant, and then pipe fitting too, right? Pipe fitting. I, I, I don't pipe fit. I, I didn't. Don't. I do not weld. My my stepdad was a welder, pipe fitter. Those guys made awesome money. But so I said, okay, well, I'll do that, and I went and worked with them for Brown and Root, actually in uh, El Segundo, California. They they had a contract to do the pipes in the refinery they had there. So I learned how to grind and and uh, so. That lasted. That must have been horrible work, though. You know, it was it was tough, but I was working with my uncle. You know, I was his you know his apprentice, and I, I knew I was going to be doing this forever. I just need to make some money, and uh, so I was doing it. And all the time I was doing that, I'm looking at the ASVAB uh, military test to to um, take the retest and get back in the military, right? Because I want to get a better score. And my wife was brought back from Japan brought her from Japan, so she was at home, so I was just doing this. And What did she think about coming to the U.S.? She was good with it. Um, Some adjustment period for her? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had went through we had went through some stuff. I Put it this way, I wasn't accepted in her family as she was in mine at the time. Now I was okay. <laughs> it only took about 20 years. You know? But <laughs> that's how it was back then, oh, yeah. right? But they're great, great people. But uh, <clears throat> she was fine with it. And I told her, I said, I'm going to go back in the military. And she's like, good, because that's that's where I was going to be happy. So I ended up joining the Army, went to uh, – Before you mm – -hmm. because this is so important to me because yeah. you were a Marine. Right. And you went to the Army. Yeah. <laughs> was this a shared recruiting station you went to, like where they have a bunch of offices? Like a MEPS where you Yeah, it was a huge MEPS in Los Angeles. So like did the Army guy, when he talked to you, run up, hey, you Marines, I got one of your guys. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think they were too busy to, to even competitive, notice. Competitive, though. Well, fiercely competitive. Yeah. Well, you know, there are a lot of Marines in the Army. Oh, yeah. I especially know. in the Special Forces. So you lucked out. He gave, I mean, he offered you a great deal. No no repeat of basic training. I didn't go to basic training. Uh, I kept my rank. I was a corporal. I can't believe I was even that high after trouble. But, that, <laughs> but you know, that's in the Marines. That's one good thing about the Marines. You can mess up, but you can come right back, you know. I mean, I got, you know, I... I got busted down from E3 to E1, you know, and then I picked it back up and got out as a corporal um, like nothing happened, you know. But uh, it was a good experience. But you, you did ask them something crazy. You asked them if you could jump out of airplanes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I wanted to. Um, once again, they said that uh, <clears throat> they said, okay, this is a job we have for you. Parachute rigger. I said, I want to jump out of airplanes. He goes, okay, we have this. You can be a parachute rigger. I'm like, oh, cool. What is that? I get to jump, right? I really didn't know. Right, right. Oh, you're going to pack parachutes. I'm like, okay. Uh, okay, I'll do that. Because I really didn't know about special forces. And the way I came about special forces was, was, was you know, kind of like by accident about the Green Berets. I really didn't know much about them. So <clears throat> I went to jump school. Right off, right from from the street, right into jump school. Wow. And I was E4, and we had a lot of junior guys there, and they were like, okay, you need to march these people. I'm like, because we're kind of reception area right, before right, I actually right, got to exactly. the basic, right? Yeah. And Marines, we, well, you know how to march. 
<laughs> right? And count cadence. And these guys were like, I, I, I didn't know how to count, ca- you know, count cadence in army speak. So I did my Marine Corps thing. And they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there were some colorful cadence we had. Yes. Then. Yes. You know, well, you know, yeah, well, anyways. Yeah. Anyway, so I got through, went to jump school. And from there, I went to Fort Lee, Virginia for parachute rigors, rigors course. How stressful is that job, though? Not very. Not very. I mean, it's you think it would be because you have other people's right, lives right. in your, 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 your hand. Um, but the, the packing the parachute is just basic steps. You follow the steps, you'll be fine. You and know. you have somebody check your work. You have a yeah, you have, you have, you have every, you know, certain parts. You have somebody you call for a rigor check. They come and look at it, make sure everything's clear. That's good. You put it in the bag. They check that part. You close the bag. You check that part. And then it gives a final check. Yeah, so it's a lot of checks in between. Now, in that job, how often were you allowed to jump? A lot. Yes. <laughs> a lot. I got a lot of jumps. And um, So if we were to look at your wings, would there be like a silver star on it, maybe I, a laurel wreath around it? Yeah, I'll jump. Oh. I'm, I'm, yeah, see here. I hate a master parachute. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we call that your master, master, bla- pass, master, master blaster. blaster. Yeah, so it was uh it was pretty good. I got my orders. I didn't know where I was going, and it says uh, first special forces group, I'm like Washington. Oh man, Washington State. Oh yes, the guys were like, dude, you're lucky. <laughs> That's a good place to do. That's a good unit because you're not going to have to worry about going to the 82nd Airborne and packing a thousand shoots a, a week. You know. How so, many riggers would be on a job like that at 80 second? God, man, their their packing facility is massive. I, I don't even know, but I figure 20, 20 tables maybe. I don't know, but it's massive because when those guys jump, it's a lot of them, and that's a lot of parachutes and all kinds of stuff. And SF, you know, if you have like, you know, 40 people jump at one time or whatever, sometimes you may just have a team jump, you know, 12 guys. It, it was pretty laid back, and they went cool places because oh, yeah. they would took, take the riggers with them, right? So in those days, were they already doing that low altitude and those halo. lighter? Yeah, they're doing. The yeah, we we're doing. They were doing halo, and uh, I. So I got there, and I started figuring out all about SF and these guys. I'm like, dude, I want to do this. Had you never seen the movie Green Beret as a child? I didn't. I did not. I I knew nothing about it, man. I know nothing about it. <laughs> And, you know. Which uh, may have been a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those guys were, 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 I looked up to them, you know. I mean, and the funny thing is, we were all wearing green berets back then. Everyone. The only thing that distinguished us was the tab, the Special Forces tab, the long tab, right? And I actually became a, a Halo parachute rigger. So I would, I went to the Halo section and I would pack their parachutes, and which afforded me to go to Halo school as a parachute rigger, not an SF guy, right? So that's what's, what's that like the first time you do that? I was uh, I was overly excited. I was I, I knew I was going out that door. I knew I was going out the ramp, right? And so I got out. I got out and I jumped. I pulled my you know I did my I was stable. I pulled my rip cord and I let it go. And I was supposed to do that. I was supposed to hold on to that thing, you know, and it came down. And I got to the ground, and my instructor comes up, and he goes, hey, so uh, how do you feel about that? I'm like, I felt pretty good. I you know, I got out. I didn't tumble. I did a left turn or a right turn, you know, then I 654, and I pulled my ripcord. And then I uh, came down. He goes, yeah, cool. Where's your ripcord? <laughs> like, he goes, because he was right next to me. Uh-oh. <laughs> he saw everything. And he threw it away. And I was a Halo instructor myself. You know, later on, that's when me and Jason, but, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So anyways, I went to Halo, I did a few trips and there was this guy, that medic guy I was telling you about, Clyde, um, Sergeant A, he was, I looked up to him, right? Real cool white guy, big, real kind of soft spoken, but he will kill you. You know, one of those guys, he's real, yeah, he, he I ended up being on the same team as him later on. Right, I love that guy to death. He's he lives in Japan right now, actually, and uh, he's like, I said, I said, hey, I'm I'm going to the Q course. I'm putting in my packet for selection. He goes, good, good. What are you gonna What am you gonna put in for? So I'm gonna be a medic. He goes, good. He goes, he goes, you're not gonna like what I'm gonna tell you right now, <laughs> right? He says, but just listen to me. He goes, go in as any other job, any special forces 
but medic. Put in for anything but medic. I'm like, why? He goes, dude, he says, because you'll get your tab as a combo guy or engineer or weapons guy. You go do some team time. You'll come back. You come back to be a medic, and it'll be a lot less pressure on you. That was sound advice. Because if you go in as anything else and you fail, that's it. You're going down to the 82nd Airborne. Yeah, nobody wants to do that. But if you go back. Sorry like, about that because we've got some folks who got their kids over there. Yeah, my, my son's in 82nd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just talked to him today. Um, yeah. So, and I was like, man. I says, okay, I'll do it. So I went in, did selection, and uh, came back as a. Uh, 18 Echo, and then went, went to Okinawa. And we always say that whether you're Tier 1 or Tier 9, you're welcome here. So if you're Tier 9 or you're just looking at this uh, brief history of the Special Forces and what a team can do, you know, they're about, and I'm going to let him give the correct definition, but I was told years ago that it's helping to ensure America's goals anyway that it's needed, if it means coming in and helping with irrigation, if oh. it means coming in oh, with yeah. internal politics in a small country. And when we say small teams, when I compare the Secret Service to Diplomatic Security Service, Diplomatic Security Service has a huge job done with a few men. Special Forces has a huge mission done with 12 men. On the team, yeah. And a, and a host of support people. But you, that team, you kind of said compromise, the things we can talk about, compromise of an engineer, mm-hmm. a communication specialist, mm-hmm. what else? Weapons. Weapons. Medic. Medic. Then you have the uh, the team tech, usually one officer, and you have the intelligence guy, and you have the commander. And we've got some language skills in there, too. Yeah, we have to go to language school. Um, usually it's at the end of the, the Q course, the qualification course, you go to language school. I didn't have to go because I tested out in Japanese, so I was lucky. But usually about six months, sometimes you go to a DLI, which is off to about a year, depends. So you did, you were out of that group of 300. Mm-hmm. 90, some of you, mm-hmm. completed the selection part, right. which is just the beginning of pure health. That's just Earth. the beginning. Yeah, that's right. just the beginning. So how long was your communications training? Communications was uh, six months, roughly. You had, back then, you had to go through Morse code. So that was eight weeks of Morse code. Dot, dot, dash, dash. Da, 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 yeah, da, 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 da. I can still, I still dream about it. Um, eight weeks of that. Eight hours, eight hours a day, five days a week. And, and then, any one of these things can wash you up if you don't oh yeah. pass. Yeah, you ha- there, there are tests, there are steps all the way through until you put that green hat on your head. Even in language school, if you don't pass language course, yeah, you're, you're done. I went to the first language school, first satellite language school mm-hmm. that they ever did. Mm-hmm. I think we were so bad, they'll never do that again. <laughs> we, we were at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. I was at E2. It was a... Field grade officer and E seven and above class, and here mm-hmm. I came in at eighteen. Mm-hmm. Oh, my German is horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but I did learn how to drink beer because I didn't know how to drink beer. Right, I learned how to eat hard boiled eggs with a shell on them. Right, <laughs> all these great things that those older enlisted and officers taught me to do. So we we finished this training. Mm-hmm. You get to a team. Mm-hmm. This is where it gets exciting because for twenty one years. You served our nation mm-hmm. by traveling the globe mm-hmm. with teams of 12, right. going where you were wanted and needed, right. not necessarily always wanted by the people you were coming to see. No, no, no. But, uh, I mean, <clears throat> that's part of the job for Special Forces. I mean, even before all this this uh, war and terror started, um, guys were out there, different teams, different groups, just, just a team. And a lot of times it wasn't even 12 men. I don't think I ever been on a 12-man team. Usually we'd have anywhere from eight, you know, nine guys. Uh, there was always a, was always a shortage. And I don't think what people realize is prior to the war on terror, there were teams everywhere even back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, that's all I'll say is that there were teams yeah. everywhere, and there are, play, there are teams right now in places that you don't even know exist right. that you haven't heard about, and they're going to do things so that you don't ever have to hear about it. Doesn't make the news or doesn't come to our shores. Right. I mean, I'll, I can tell you one one uh, mission we did. We were in it was northern Thailand, and Saudi crop. Yeah, Saudi crop. The uh, the Thai border patrol was really getting their asses handed to them by by uh, 
Kunsa and uh, the, the Golden Triangle, I'm sure you've heard of it, but it was a serious heroin trade going on up there. <clears throat> and the they needed help bad. They were getting murdered. And so they asked us, our team, we actually did a, a, a composite team. So we took a team plus of guys and we went down there for two months and we trained these guys everything from how to run a checkpoint raids reconnaissance did a lot of a lot of marksmanship training a whole lot of that and some other classes and we trained these got this unit up really good and uh we don't we left everything was good and then uh i came home so it was some months later but i think i was i was actually back in the states and i was watching 60 minutes and then I saw they, they did a special on the Thai Border Patrol and how they were kicking ass and all the all the heroin they they you know they took, which was great. You know, hey man, our our, our work is done. Then they put bonnies on our heads. So I said, I'll do my dance, but I'm not gonna take an AK-47 on the mm-hmm. field. I'll wear all my scarves, right? right. Do my little hobby, <laughs> 